Well, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the symposium at USC. My name is Vinayak Barney. I'm the chair of the symposium. I'm a joint faculty of urbanism at uh, the Price School and the School of Architecture at USC. And I welcome you to what promises to be a very provocative and uh, incredible symposium with some truly amazing participants. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about framing this symposium, how it came about, the genesis, and lay the text the, and the groundwork for the discussions to come. The, uh, the, the foundations of this event lie in uh, a book whose roots go back about five and a half years ago. Um, I was having lunch with my dear friend Asim Anam, and we were talking about how we now live in a time when there's really no shortage of attention on Asian cities. Barely 20 years ago, uh, Asian cities were so-called footnotes in most important books on urban design and cities. And for a long time, the idea of what constitutes the contemporary city was predicated on very dominant rubrics uh, about the Western world and the Euro-American city being the model. Uh, the so I want to just read a few excerpts from this book and what it's about and how it came about and what, what lays the foundations of this, of this idea. The, uh, the idea of the emerging Asian city is a huge, complex, capacious subject. It's a subject that evades any kind of fixed definition. Uh, it is about an urban landscape covering almost a third of the planet's land mass. Uh, it's a landscape that occupies nearly half of the planet's inhabitants and it occupies some of the world's oldest, largest, densest cities. Uh, it encompasses the histories of major world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, as well as some of the most dramatic colonizations and westernizations outside the Euro-American world. Today, it is a landscape that has the world's tallest building, Dubai's Burj Khalifa, the fastest growing cities in China, and two of the fastest growing economies, China and India. It includes more than half of the world's slum population. And according to the United Nations 2001 Global Report on Human Settlements, by 2015, Asia will include an estimated 153 from a total of 358 global cities with populations exceeding 1 million. That's an astounding piece, piece of work, piece of, piece of information. And 15 from an estimated 27 mega cities with populations exceeding 10 million. So we, as we talked about all this, we, we felt that on the one hand, the history of Asian cities is almost as old, is literally as old as human civilization. But for the longest time, ironically, the place given to Asian cities has been probably at most a footnote. All this has changed. There's an increasing body of scholarship. There's some incredible books that have come out. In fact, the very day this book was released, within a week before and after, two or three other major books came out. One by Nihal Pereira, Transforming Asian Cities, and then the Roy Welding, uh, Welding cities. So there are incredible scholars producing very profound studies on what these, the, this landscape means for all of us. Uh, as we conversed about this, it, it occurred to us that despite this amazing body of scholarship, which is incredible, of which this book forms one part uh, of, of many, it, it, it has seemed to be and continues to be a, ve a very big challenge to try and encapsulate what Asia means uh, in, in a book of sorts. Uh, to add to this, the word Asian itself has become a kind of a soccer ball. I mean, at, at its worst, it is tossed around to regional identities and slapped on to particular places in Asia. And while many books title themselves as Asian, uh, they do not capture, for many of us, the breadth of what constitutes Asia, because they partly believe that dissecting Asia into regional identities is perhaps the more clear way of understanding its contemporary landscape. So how does one organize a book about Asia? How, how does one go about it? Asia itself is an elusive term. For architects and urbanists, both in Asia and the West, the term often suggests a loosely defined landmass along the Pacific and Indian Oceans, an imagined concept, a camouflaged reference to diverse sociocultural diversities, a metaphor diffusing perpetual binaries such as East and West, vernacular and colonial, Asian and modern. And for many, they have written about this extensively, therefore seems best not even to probe for any fundamental cohesion beyond that coming from propinquity uh, and the conventional acceptance of Asia as a loose rubric. So as we talked about this more and more, it occurred to us that while they are not necessarily or entirely wrong 
in, in, in what they're arguing here. This continuing ambivalence towards Asia, for many of us, only reinforced the pressing need for a broad book on Asian cities. To argue that if on the one hand, there is this tendency to probe into the depth of regional places in Asia and try and understand Asia as a series of diverse aspects. Perhaps there's another way where you step back miles away and go deep into the origins of Asia, how it began to what it is today, and try and encapsulate a broad brush of what unifies it. Where do these places overlap? Where do they separate? And this is sort of where this book takes off. It argues that many of the phenomena, many of the social cultural religious, other phenomena that have, that have formed the contemporary landscape of Asia have not happened in isolation. There are trajectories that are completely intertwined. And this can be a very important optic to understand what is happening in Asia uh, as, as, as trajectories that, that overlap. So what I want to do is, is quickly take you through some, some, uh, some key aspects of the book's introduction, which argues that the Asian urban landscape is today comprehensible as a dynamic mosaic of myriad landscapes that are somehow congealed into a unified entity. Some of these landscapes are ancient, multi-layered palimpsests. Others are brand new. Some landscapes appear to be rapidly changing. Others are relatively stagnant. Some spread across vast areas. Others are concentrated, but equally conspicuous. Similar landscapes and phenomena appear at different times in different places, denying the Asian landscape any linear evolutionary pattern. But most significantly for us, they all coexist and they are all simultaneously evolving. So what are some of these landscapes and what, what, what do they mean and how do they provide us optics to understand Asia? The oldest of these are Asia's virgin landscapes, whose patterns emerge as much from sociocultural beliefs as pragmatic responses to climate and geography. Here one finds the ruins of the world's earliest planned cities like Mohenjo-daro, one finds the ruins of Parsa, Persepolis, the ceremonial capital of the Alchemid dynasty, circa 15, 515 BCE. One finds China's first metropolis, Shangan, built to the northwest of Xi'an with an area of around 35 square kilometers, probably equaled only by Rome in size. And one finds the sacred landscape of Banaras, Varanasi, uh, perhaps the oldest living city in the world, or originally called Kashi, where the Buddha gave his first sermon. The second landscape emerges from numerous intra-Asian hybridities, cross-cultural currents, social-religious transfers. Even as Rome is being reborn from urban decay as a new Christianopolis, Kyoto is born in Japan as a new Xenopolis. The urban grid of Kyoto is based on its Chinese predecessor, Shangan. The spread of Islam sees the emergence of great capitals in Timur Samarkand in Uzbekistan and Shah Abbas Isfahan in Iran. This Islamic trajectory finds its way into the Indian subcontinent, where new cities, Bijapur, Agra, Fatehpur Sikri, generate new models that are neither found in one world or the other. They are distinctly hybrid. They are both Islamic and Indian. They are both Persian and Islamic. While the Persian paradigms on the mausoleum and the quadrangular Charbagh garden find their teleological end in the magnificent Taj Mahal. The third landscape is created by Asia's colonizations. The earliest visit to, visitors to Asia from an authentic history standpoint are the Greeks. But Alexandra's influence remains largely limited to Indian sculpture and art. From an urban standpoint, it is the Portuguese that come first. As colonizers with a missionary zeal, they smear the verdant tropical landscape of Goa with an entire transect of churches, chapels, and wayside crosses, and entire towns emulating their homeland. What the Portuguese do in Goa in Macau, the Spanish do in Manila. They destroy circa 1570 and replace the indigenous habitat with a new gridded wall city, the Intramuros, which you can see to the left up there. Uh, uh, under its succeeding American possession in 1905, American planner Daniel Burnham designs a brand new plan for the city, partially built, uh, but that's the original plan. Uh, we're creating two concomitant Western urbanisms on a non-Western landscape. But it is the British Raj, eventually, that becomes the largest of such landscapes, becoming by far the largest colonial imprint across Asia, proclaimed as much by large monuments as modest structures, such as canals, courts, and cantonments. The histories and legacies of these imposed or infused landscape gels into Asia's emerging identities. The fourth landscape emerges from Asia's self-imposed westernizations. In, 16, in 1868, the Tokugawa, Tokugawa era ends in Japan 
and ushers what we now know as the Meiji Restoration. And Japan opens its doors to Western influences for the first time in centuries. In 1872, the slide up there, Ginza becomes Japan's first designed Western street, with British architect Thomas Walters replacing the fire-ravaged maze of traditional wooden structures with brick buildings and widely tree-lined boulevards. In the early 1900s, Denenchofu, a Tokyo suburb, is designed along British planner Ebenezer Howard's Garden City model, with concentric streets, radial boulevards, and verdant open spaces becoming the first such paradigm in the Far East. Eventually, of course, Japan's defeat in World War II incepts a brand new nation under the American occupation, making it the first industrialized non-Western democracy in the world. Meanwhile, China enters the Republican era. In 1949, Mao Zedong's proclamation ushers a new communist goal of transforming consumer cities into producer cities. Beijing's 1950 development plans follow Moscow's example, dividing the city into functional zones with exurban industries surrounding an administrative urban core. Tiananmen, the imperial forecourt, is redesigned as a new socialist setting, creating one of the largest urban squares in the world. The fifth landscape is formed by Asia's embrace of modern urbanism and architecture. Circa 1951, barely four years after the British depart from India, Le Corbusier is given his largest ever project in Chandigarh, the new capital of Punjab, fueled by Prime Minister Nehru's mandate for a utopian city unfettered by the traditions of India's past. Circa 1961, the construction of the 130 meter high Monument National in post-independence Jakarta is inspired by the Eiffel Tower. Even as the city's massive southward expansion manifests an ambitious new nation building free from any colonial reminiscence. Meanwhile, as Japanese architect Kenzo Tange proposes an unbuilt utopian plan for Tokyo's expansion with nine infrastructural roofs and high-rise megastructures spanning Tokyo Bay, the Chungking mansions are completed in 3644 Nathan Road, bringing the first high-rise paradigm in the Asian landscape. The sixth landscape, emerges from the parallel offspring of rapid modernization. The squatter, as a concomitant urbanism of significant, significant socioeconomic consequences, begins to garner attention. Here one encounters landscapes today like Dharavi, one of Asia's largest slums. Located in suburban Mumbai, it is spread over 0.67 square miles. It provides cheap, illegal dwelling alternatives for around 600,000 people with rents as low as $4 a month, while also nurturing a thriving microeconomy with a total annual turnover of over $600 million. From Lebanon to Jakarta to Dhaka, the place of these illegal informal habitats within the franchise city remains one of the most gripping issues of Asian urbanism. The seventh landscape comprises Asia's indigenous rural habitats that are struggling to find their place within its rapid industrialization. Here one finds the Bang, the aquatic villages of Thailand with their infamous floating markets, the agrarian hamlets of Borneo, the fast disappearing urban villages of Guangzhou, the forgotten Kanats and Kares, the subterranean water channels of Yaz and Aleppo, and the tribal villages of Inner Mongolia. The imposed conversion of these places, patterns, and people into tourist magnets, their merciless absorption into cosmopolitan landscapes, or their complete obliteration raise very difficult questions on humanitarian values and socioeconomic cultural justice that demand to be understood and answered. The eighth landscape emerges from the ambivalent reception of modern urbanism in Asia. The idea of the contemporary city as a culturally appropriated model, and I emphasize the word appropriated here, gains attention with architects and planners seeking to reflect a sense of history and regionalism in both the processes and products through which cities are made at an urban scale. One of the most significant experiments in this regard is Baghdad's reconstruction from 1979 to 1983. When second and third generation Euro-American modernists gather to participate in an ambition urban redevelopment fueled by a booming oil economy. It includes significant conservation efforts in historic cores such as Kurafa, Gailani, uh, and ambitious inner city revitalizations uh, in places such as Rusafa, and the most famous being the Kurafa Street redevelopment with regulations, with regulations, mind you, encouraging densification with the visual uniformity of arabesque motifs. Such efforts are essentially modernist in attitude, 
but they reveal a newfound sensitivity towards concepts of pedestrianization, street life, selective urban infill, and a renewed interest in local history and preservation. So Asia, in this sense, begins to now provide an intellectual canvas to both affirm the limitations of Western modernism as perhaps to redefine it. The ninth landscape stems from what we call Asia's instant cities or sudden cities. These are characterized less by size and more by the sheer pace of development. They reveal dramatic regurgitations of their origi originating Western modernisms. Here one finds the streetscapes of Shinjuku and Akihabara, whose psychedelic electro signage pales the consumerist expressionisms of Las Vegas and Times Square. One witnesses the dramatic evolution of Asia's most vertical uh, iconic metropolis, Hong Kong, that transforms from a colonial port in the dominant center of international finance and commerce. In a way, Hong Kong, for many of us, represents a hyper Manhattan, where one could argue that the ideas proposed for 1920s New York have been enacted and perhaps even surpassed. Uh, but, what, but there is more. Dubai, for example, goes in four decades from a city of 58,000 people to 1.5 million natives, with an additional 5.1 million annual visitors. Its southward expansion before the collapse of the global, global economy remains one of the most ambitious and dramatic redevelopments the human, humankind has ever seen. And, and then one also finds Napido, the new 7,000 square kilometer administrative capital of the Republic Union of, uh, of Burma, Myanmar, that is spatially reminiscent of Islamabad or Brasilia. The tenth landscape emerges from Asia's post-industrial urban models, where new prerogatives of sustainability, pedestrian dominance, incrementalism, non-utopian planning, and cultural appropriateness seem like antidotes to what we now know, or what we call rampant sprawl. Here one finds Putrajaya, Malaysia is 11,300 acre built from scratch, environmentally friendly administrative capital. The American anti sprawl movement, New Urbanism, and its interconnected streets and figural open spaces are manifested in new towns such as Lavasa and Dos Rios in the Philippines. Meanwhile, nine new towns are built outside Shanghai, and their themes Swedish, English, Spanish, American, Dutch, German, traditional Chinese. One of them, Thamestown, the one at the bottom, unabashedly replicating the classic English market town with cobbled streets and Victorian terraces. Now, all these landscapes, though shaped by diverse phenomenological forces, are all engaged in dynamic evolutionary processes and they share complex relationships with each other. It is true Asia contains many nations and region-specific macro cultures that are all trying to maintain their individual identities. But eventually, for this book and for us, for me, the fundamental forces shaping Asian cities are neither isolated nor regionally necessarily unique. The Indian subcontinent, for example, is historically intertwined with the cultures of the Persian and Gulf region. China or Dubai's rapid urbanization is an echo of Japan's unprecedented growth in the 60s and 70s. Informal urbanisms are seamlessly intertwined with metropolitan landscapes across Asia. Democracy, the advent of democracy, provides a consistent lens to understand many Asian cities and their evolutions. Colonial landscapes are gradually taking on new post-industrial identities across many countries in Asia. And overall, Asia's oldest cities, among the oldest in the world, are themselves cultural repositories and palimpsests of so many cultures that are very hard to unpack. So in order to embrace this ambiguity, this complexity, and this pluralism, what this book does is purposefully avoids a place-based or chronological structure. Its framing instead comes down to three large, broad lenses. Traditions offers critical counter-narratives to the modernity of Asian cities. The resilience of indigenous urbanisms, the dilemma surrounding conservation efforts in historic cores, the place of grassroots efforts and populist forces in city making are all highlighted as contemporary pan-Asian phenomena that cannot be ignored. Tensions reflects on the legacies, mind you, not the histories necessarily, as much as the legacies of the original collisions and infusions of Western and Asian urbanisms. Colonialism and early modernism are gauged as parallel phenomena. 
that grapple with a east-west dialectic, whether by contention or whether by will. Have these seemingly hegemonic places been assimilated, critiqued, or rejected by the generations that have followed? Are these infusions little more than dormant symbols of a recent history or integral cultural components that have long been absorbed into Asia? And finally, transformation gleans into Asia's new emerging post-industrial and globalizing identities, weighing their intentions and aspirations against their price and promise. What are the forces and lineages that are shaping these new utopias? How should we read them? Are they little more than towers of Babel? Or are they conscientious visions and experiments to a social, economic, and cultural progress? The voices that have written in this book are broad and plural as well, which actually adds to the depth and richness of this book. They are both from academia and from practice. They are both from East and from the West, all woven together. Many of the authors have grown up and lived in Asia and offer us a very profound understanding of Asian cities that are born out of their personal experience. Others have lived in Asia but have returned to other parts of the world, US and Europe, and so use Asia as a, as a springing back intellectual board and create a feedback loop. Uh, but it is the nature and quality of these authors, architects, architectural historians, planners, urbanists, anthropologists, historic preservationists, who are all straddling multiple worlds and therefore create multiple perspectives that allows this book to be rich and dynamic. Using this as the backdrop, this symposium now poses a question as the continuing discussion that emerges from this book. While many Asian cities are going through the same problems as Western cities, one of the things that emerges from this book is that the, the processes, the expectations, and the forces that are shaping Asian cities are significantly different than the ones that are happening, at least in Europe and America. And while this may seem like a relatively obvious fact, it's a very difficult question because in a time when many Western urbanists, most Western intellectuals are invested very heavily in looking at Asia. How do we intervene with Asian cities? How do we read them? How do we try to understand them? So I just want to very quickly take you through four or five dominant phenomena that, that I want to just leave on the table for provocations for further discussion. Uh, one of the first is the difference in governance structures and power structures and therefore in administrative processes through how cities are made. To the, to the right hand side of the slide is uh, a, a classic sort of reformist reactionary zoning uh, from the United States. A code that now challenges land use and is trying to reform it through a regulated idea of urban form. This is what new urbanists and others have been propounding as a progressive reactionary aspect to urban sprawl. Uh, the question is, there are places in Asia where this may be applicable, but the fundamental governance structures of Asia themselves are very different. The Bird's Nest Stadium in China, for example, opened eight months after it was complete in design. Uh, an environmental impact report alone in the United States would have taken you three years for a building like this. Uh, monarchies, uh, autocracies, how do we navigate, how do we situate ourselves within these? Rapid population and urban explosions, land scarcity. Uh, this is Tokyo. When, when we look at Tokyo from a morphological standpoint, your first reaction has to be it is a damn chaotic city. But what a lot of people forget is the process through which Tokyo was made circa 1947 itself was completely different from probably any American or European city. In, in, in a sheer will of desperation to build a city that was lying completely prostrate, the government built the infrastructure but gave a complete laissez-faire approach to regulation to actually incentivize people to build the city. So there are many other ways through which cities have emerged. They are livable. People do live very thriving lives. What does this mean for how we intervene with them? Uh, massive rural to urban migrations and extreme economic polarizations and large informal economies. Uh, a, a, a phenomenon that remains intrinsic to any intervention we make. How do we, how do we balance the polarities of many cities towards social justice and equity? This is a question that remains at the heart of any significant intervention. The dominance of religion. Uh, Religion remains a dominant force in several countries. The question is, in Asia, how do we make it a catalyst? What does it mean? How, how does it become a force of either manipulation or, on the other hand, transformation in the most positive sense? 
there is there is the ambitions of a rising middle class in uh, 20 30 years ago merely 20 30 years ago india produced one fifth the amount of cars it does now and sold even less than that today we have almost 20000 cars uh, driving on indian streets that are bought fresh every day it's an alarming number same is happening in china what does this mean how do we how do we stop the aspirations of a rising middle class how do we curb how do we intervene with them? Extreme urban resilience. The map that you see to your left is, the, is a diagram uh, of Tokyo, the evolution of Tokyo. Now, if you look at a diagram like this of any European or American city, what would normally happen is the black would consistently and sequentially increase. Tokyo remains one of the very few, it's not the only one, one of the very few cities in the world where a, a, a figural analysis of the city is usually blurred by gray from time to time. These are massive earthquakes that happened from time to time. And it shows you how in the history of Tokyo's evolution, you had portions of the city entirely devastated. The city rebuilt one after the other, growing seamlessly as a palimpsest from time to time. Uh, so I want to leave you with a couple of questions to trigger the symposium. The subtitle of the symposium is called Alternative Approaches to Urban Theory, Pedagogy, and Practice. What is alternative? How do we want to understand alternative? So here are some thoughts, and there could be more, but I just want to provoke these to the participants. For me, alternative has at least five connotations today. As a counterpoint to contemporary European and American positions in urban theory and practice that while I would argue are theoretically applicable, they are often impractical in many parts of Asia. Alternative as a look beyond the assumed expertise of state, municipality, and the so-called trained professional. I'm a practicing urbanist. Uh, there are many other alternatives to the franchised, trained, educated, erudite urbanist. What does this mean? How do they teach us new ways of approaching cities? Uh, alternative as a critique of the preoccupation with urban form and morphology and the physical environment as the ultimate lens of urban success. Alternative in interrogation of the various ideal city barometers from livability, sustainability, democracy, social equity. These are all terms that we believe in, we throw out, it means different things to all of us. Uh, what does this mean in contexts where the expectations of urban life themselves are different to begin with? And finally, alternative in validation of the idea that successful urban transformation can in fact be measured by other lenses above and beyond the analytical and quantitative ones that we as planning professionals or academics typically use. And finally, just leave you with three questions to get this discussion rolling. And, and I hope many more will emerge during the, the proceedings. What are the phenomena and forces that are instigating alternative engagements in Asian cities? What are such various modes of engagement in theory, pedagogy, and practice? And what efforts and initiatives, some of which I hope our scholars will share with us today, exemplify such alternative practices?